let's start with the idea of the area of a rectangle. Now, what do we mean by area? Uh, well, we could think of area as uh, how much of this thing uh, would we need to paint if we were to cover it with paint, or how much land would we own if we owned this rectangle of three units by five units, just as an example. We would agree that one square unit is a unit uh, is, is a square one length unit on each side. If we make that agreement, then we can divide this rectangle very easily into units of one square unit each. So I'm not doing a really good job of making these exactly even, but let's pretend that I have. Okay. And they get bigger as we go to this side, but let's assume that I'd drawn that a little better and that all these were equal. Uh, then we would have how many square units? Uh, if all these are equal, if I divided it really evenly, we'd have one, two, three, four, five by uh, one, two, three, four, five. And what, that's three times five, isn't it? We could count them up or we could just multiply three times five. So what we have here is three times five equals 15 square units. Now you should try to draw this and do better than I did. See if you can divide those up by I a little more evenly. Uh, in any case, you understand how that's going to work. Now, this works fine as long as we have a whole number of units on each side. Uh, if we have a fractional number of units on each side, or even worse, if we have two sides whose lengths are, or at least one side whose length is an irrational number, how can we do this? Well, if these are rational numbers, fractions, integer over integer fractions, basically, then we can just make our units smaller. And we can kind of go to a least uh, uh, common denominator of our fractions and make the units of that size, and we can work that out. If the numbers are irrational, then we have to make all kinds of abstract arguments about how it works. However, it does work for irrational and ra uh, it, it does work for rational numbers, and we can extend the definition to the irrational numbers. So this works for integers for sure. Uh, we can adapt it to work for rationals. We can extend our definition to work for irrational lengths of sides. So it should be clear, I said before, if the sides are integers, well, if the sides are positive integers, because we won't talk about the area if the sides are negative, a negative side doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, if these are both positive integers, length and width, then clearly we can divide it into, we can divide the rectangle into units of one square each and the number will be equal to the uh, length of this side multiplied by the length of this side. It's not difficult then to prove that this also works if the lengths of the sides are rational numbers. If we use instead of a one unit square, a fractional square whose sides have length equal to the least common multiple of the denominators of the rational numbers, um, then we can make sense of that. We can say how many of those little squares would it take to fill a one unit square and uh, work from there. Okay, so we can basically divide this into smaller squares, a certain number of which add up to a one unit square. And I'll be asking a question along those lines in a minute. Um, okay, now, uh, uh, well beyond the scope of what we can talk about here, but take my word for it, there are more abstract arguments that extend this to irrational lengths. And you have to use a fair amount of fairly abstract mathematics to actually do that in a rigorous manner. So we're not going to do that, um, although I will say that it comes about mainly because uh, you can get a rational number that's arbitrarily close to any irrational number. But don't worry about that right now. That's for a more advanced course. Okay, so the point though is that the formula A equals L times W works for real length L 
and real width W. So if L and W are both real numbers, that means integers, rational numbers, or irrational numbers, um, the formula can be proven to work. So what would we do if the rectangle was instead of three by five, it was three and a half by five and a third? Now, we want to say that, well, we just multiply three and a half by five and a third. That's seven halves times 16 thirds. That's going to be seven times 16 is 112 divided by six. 112 divided by six is what? It's uh, 18 and one third. Okay, 18 and two thirds. Okay? You can work that out. That's easy to calculate. And you should be able to calculate that in your head because you should be able to do these multiplications, numbers up to 20, and reduce them, and so forth, and check whether I did that right or not. Okay, so we have three and a half by five and a third, and we want to say that the area is that times that. How can we prove that that's really so? We could prove that this is so by just defining this to be one square unit and breaking this into 15 of those one unit squares. What can we do here? We can't break these into unit squares. Now, you know, there are various things that we could do to uh, simplify the problem. But what I'm going to say is um, if we break this into squares whose sides have lengths that are the least common multiple of your two denominators, that would be like a least common denominator, although uh, I don't want to put us in the context of the least common denominator because we're not going to add or subtract these two numbers, but you can still kind of think about that parallel. But if the least common multiple of two and three is six. Okay, so what we would want to do is we've got our unit square get a little ambitious with that, but we got our unit square, right? This is one square unit. Now, I'm going to claim that we can break this into a whole number of perfect squares whose sides are one-sixth of a unit. So what I want to do is I want to make A square with sides of one sixth of a length unit. I claim that by breaking this down enough, I can fill this completely with squares of that size, and I can figure out how many of these squares it would take to make this square. Now, I want you to prove that the area of this square is three and a half by five and one third by using this one square unit and this square of side one sixth unit. Now, I'm going to give you a little guidance on how that might be done. I'm a little reluctant to give you any guidance on this as opposed to just throwing you in to see if you can sink or swim. But just to you know, give you a little general introduction here, I'll break it down for you just a little bit. I'd like you to explain how, <coughs> excuse me, how to fill the figure exactly with squares of length one sixth unit. Now, what I mean by a square of length one sixth unit, <coughs> and I don't have room to write out all the words, is a square whose its sides each have length one sixth unit. Now, if one side has a length one sixth unit and it's a square, then both sides have length one sixth unit. So I can talk about squares of length one sixth unit if we simply agree that the length is a length of a side. I could say side length, but uh, don't have a lot of room here. Okay, then I want you to argue irrefutably, airtight argument that no lawyer or mathematician could challenge successfully that the area of one of these small squares is 1 36th of an area unit. Now, you're going to want to say, well, 1 6 times 1 6 is 1 36. That's the formula. Well, we're trying to prove the blame formula. You can't use the formula 
for finding the area to prove the formula for finding the area. So you can't do that. You're going to have to give me a geometric argument that the area of one of these small squares is 1 36th of an area unit. Once you have that, then I note you can't use the formula to make this argument. That would be circular. You'd be using the formula to prove the formula. Okay. Once you've done these two things, it should be fairly easy to prove that the area is 3 and a half times 5 and 1 third. A similar argument would work for L equals 738 over 67, W equals 1.7039. Okay, make a very similar, same argument you used here would work just fine, but of course you'd have to adapt uh, the size of the little square. And you might think about what the size of that little square, uh, the uh, largest little square that you could use to figure out this area. Or for any, uh, so you could do that. You could make that argument. You could figure out the size of the square. Um, but of course, you wouldn't want to try to draw this. Okay, um, it would be pretty much impossible um, unless you had a really, really big piece of paper. Um, and a lot of time. Uh, and it would also work for L equals P over Q, W equals R over S, where P, Q, R, and S are all positive integers. Now, that's the second problem. What would you uh, do differently? How would you make the argument for this or for this? If you can make the argument for this, then you've proven it for all rational numbers, and you've proven that this works as long as your sides are positive rational numbers. Still haven't approached the question of irrational, and we're not even going to talk about that at this point.